Hi, my name is Rachel Botsman. I'm an author and the Trust Fellow at Oxford University. Developing ideas is really quite a wonderful but strange thing to do because it involves taking lots of lots of complex threads and trying to tie them together and make it clear for people. And the thing that I've learnt is that at times you can feel completely lost and then all of a sudden these things join together and suddenly become something that is quite clear and hopefully compelling to people. And what it involves this journey of creativity I found is an incredible tolerance for ambiguity and a lot of humility. Um, a lot of being able to admit and even take joy and pleasure in the fact that you don't understand something or you got something completely wrong. Drawing and visualization has always played a really important role in my work. I actually studied fine art at Oxford and it was there that I learned the power of drawings to take really complex things and make them clear, but also how to emotionally connect with people. And the reason why I love drawing and visualization is because you can iterate really, really fast. I find when I write, I tend to get quite precious with words. And the other thing with drawing is you know when you've really landed on something that you can show it to someone and they have little or no understanding of what you're working on and they can get the idea from a simple sketch. When I look back on my work, I can see that it falls into distinct chapters. Although when I'm working on it, it's not how it feels. It's kind of like a journey. One idea evolves into another. And what I've realized is that there is real joy and pleasure in continually challenging and rethinking our ideas, that you start to understand what you don't know. I'd actually be really worried if I still was thinking and saying the same thing as I was 10 years ago. So 2008 was actually a really interesting year. So much was happening in the world. Obama had been elected as president. Of course, there was the financial crash. And then we were seeing all these things happening with technology. So Facebook passed a platform called MySpace. Companies like eBay and Amazon were really starting to grow at an incredible rate. And we were seeing new companies pop up, things like Zipcar and Rent the Runway and this tiny company called Airbnb and Uber and TaskRabbit. And all these platforms and marketplaces started to emerge that were changing the way that we could live, work and consume. So I went on a, a literally a tour meeting all these entrepreneurs and it was funny because uh, you know, Brian Chesky, the founder of Airbnb, and Travis, the founder of Uber, people didn't know who these entrepreneurs were. They were living and working in these, these tiny flats, like the story of entrepreneurship. And so I got really immersed inside these companies and, and started to understand what was happening. And that led to my first body of work, um, which at the time I called collaborative consumption because... I was really intrigued with the human connection. So I was really intrigued whether this could become a more human form of consumerism. And then the media uh, actually redubbed it the sharing economy, that this was a whole new form of sharing. And that's where what's mine is yours. Um, and this whole work of studying trust between strangers and how technology was impacting that really started to take form. I watched these companies grow into billion dollar companies and get bigger and bigger and open offices up all around the world. And people started saying, you know, I've been on holiday in Airbnb and really talking about it as something that they were proud of. And the thing that interested me was not how much they were worth um, or how big they were getting, but really this piece of, of human connections, how they were enabling people to meet in the online world and have these really powerful offline connections. If you look deep underneath platforms, whether it's Etsy or eBay or Amazon or Airbnb or Uber, or whatever they may be, Tinder, essentially you have the same dynamic. You have technology changing the way supply meets demand. I have a need and you have a have, and those two things can find one another. 
And what makes that possible is how technology creates the efficiency for the need and the have to be connected and how it creates the trust. Trust is so funny. It's a word that we all use a lot. But when you stop to really think about what trust is, it's really hard to define. I found in my research that there are more definitions of trust than any other sociological concept. There are more definitions of trust than love. And the way I think about trust is that it is essentially a feeling. It's something that we feel towards someone or something. And the way I define trust is really simple. Trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. And when you start to see trust through this lens, it starts to explain why it's this remarkable force that we cannot live without, that enables us to place our faith in strangers, to take these leaps into the unknown, why it's the birthplace of innovation and creativity. What struck me from going deep inside all these platforms and marketplaces was how much they were changing our behaviors. I know some of these things seem quite normal right now, but the idea of going online and finding a date and then meeting up in the real world or pressing your phone and getting in the car with a total stranger or booking a holiday in someone's house on the other side of the world where you don't know who they are. These all ideas all seemed really weird and risky. And this led me to an idea that I call trust leaps. A trust leap happens whenever we take a risk to do something new or to do something differently. Essentially, when you're asking someone to trust a new product, a new service, a new idea, you're asking them to go from something that is really known and familiar into something that is unknown. You're asking them to cross this sea of uncertainty. And the remarkable force that enables this leap to happen is trust. So behind every change in behavior and every new innovation, you see a trust leap. One thing that fascinates me when you go inside organizations is how they think and talk about trust. And I'm always fascinated by how people are measured. How do they track what they value and how they're performing? And what you often hear people talk about is the language of money. Now, of course, money is important in business and in companies, but money only goes so far. If you have an organization and it's entirely built around money, that is the currency of transactions. What you need inside organizations, particularly organizations that really are driven by innovation and people taking risks, you need trust. So the way I think of the value of trust, and it's a really useful frame, is that if money is the currency of transactions, trust is the currency of interactions. Around the time I was writing my second book, Who Can You Trust?, there was a big trust crisis brewing in all different areas of our lives. We were seeing trust imploding and being eroded in profound ways. VW emission scandal, all the corruption happening in the banks. There was Brexit, Trump had been elected, and we were starting to see the dramatic consequences of misinformation. And what we were hearing is that the answer to all these trust issues in our lives was transparency. If we make the banks more transparent, if we understand their terms and conditions, trust in them will increase. If we make how these tech platforms uh, work more transparent, people will trust them more. But this relationship between transparency and trust needs a massive rethink. It's really interesting asking people to try to visualize the relationship between trust and transparency. So what I've asked hundreds, if not thousands of people to draw is to draw a simple graph where you have two axes and then to put trust up here and then transparency down here. 
and for them to plot how they visualize the relationship between the two. And what you generally see is most people draw a positive relationship. So as transparency increases, they imagine trust going up. Some people, depending on their experience, will then draw a plateau as it loses impact over time. And this is so interesting to me that people see a positive relationship between the two, that if you make things more transparent, that trust will increase. When if you think about it, trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. So this idea that trust is increasing as you increase transparency simply isn't true. If you need things to be transparent, you've kind of given up on trust. What transparency does is it reduces the need for trust. Now, I'm not saying that transparency is a bad thing, but we should think of transparency as a tool rather than an end state. And the other thing that is really powerful and needs rethinking in relationship to transparency and trust is the real enemy of trust is deception. I want to live in a world where people can have privacy and you can keep secrets, not where you have to be transparent around everything. What's more important is that we focus on the integrity of systems and culture and leadership and organization. And we understand the information that we can trust so that we value the truth. And I really worry about this idea that is out there that transparency is going to fix trust issues in all different areas of our lives. The number one question that I am asked, hands down, is how do I build more trust? And this is from leaders in organization all the way through to designers and creative teams. I want to build more trust. And language is so revealing in terms of people's relationship to an idea. Well, building more trust suggests that you are in control, right? So if I behave in this way, then I'm going to get more trust from you. Unfortunately, that's not the way trust works. Trust is something that we have to continuously earn because trust is something that another person decides whether to give to you. Now, the interesting thing is that even though trust feels like something that is quite intangible, there is a science behind what makes someone or something trustworthy, why we decide to give our trust to another person. And it comes down to what we call the traits of trustworthiness. I think about this in two parts. So capability, which is really how we do things, and then character, which is why we do things. And underneath that, you've got four different ingredients or traits. So on the capability side, you have competence. And competence is really about whether you have the skills and the experience and the time and the resources to do what you say you're going to do. So are you capable of doing what you promise to do? The second trait is reliability. And reliability has a lot to do with your relationship with time and how consistent or inconsistent your behaviors are over time. So one of the things we look for in trustworthy people is a consistency in behaviors because this means that we know what to expect of them. And it's competence and reliability that come together to create this feeling that you can depend on someone, that they're capable of doing what they say they're gonna do. There's a central idea to trustworthiness that is absolutely key to understand, and that's consistency the way you show up day in, day out is far more important than intensity. But where deep trust really forms is around the character side of being trustworthy. And that is made up of two key traits. The first being empathy, which I always find the hardest to draw, but it's really about feeling what someone else is feeling and understanding their emotions and walking in their shoes. But where empathy really forms deep trust 
is not just in feelings and thinking, it's really about turning that into action. So that person doesn't feel like that you just care, but also that you're gonna support them. And then the last trait, which in my opinion is the most important trait, is integrity. And the way I visualize integrity is that you have to sort of imagine um, intentions and motives. And you have to imagine situations where someone's intentions and motives are completely misaligned. So you have one intention and motive, and I have another one, and there is misalignment. And then what you're looking for in integrity is not, it's rare that there's perfect alignment, but close alignment around what your interests are and that my interests are, there is an alignment there. And that's where really deep integrity starts to form. And what's interesting is when you look at major trust issues happening in the world, that could be someone you don't trust in politics, it could be someone you don't trust in business, it could be a scandal that happened, a data leak, whatever it may be, you often find that this is the root cause, that people no longer believe that that platform, that leader, that party, whatever it may be, that their interests are aligned with your best interests. What do you do when trust breaks down? How do you repair it? The pain and the damage that can be caused through broken trust is immense. It's something that we all have to experience. The key with trust is to catch it when it's wobbling before it goes into this complete state of distrust. And I found a really helpful tool is to actually go back to the traits of trustworthiness. So rather than having that conversation where you sort of don't trust someone and you can't identify it, you can ask yourself, is this a competence problem? Or maybe it has more to do with our empathy. And thinking in this way enables us to identify what the problem might be and also to have a more constructive conversation. So one of the biggest challenges we face in the world today is really the relationship between trust and the truth. Um, what really is true? And to understand that question, it's really important to dive into our beliefs, why we believe certain things, why we become really attached to ideas and the way of thinking about something. And something that interests me is when you look at language around trust in yourself. It's very much loaded with things like never doubt yourself, be really confident, be really assertive. And I think this has led to a really big cultural issue in the world today, is that we're being told that trust comes from people and leaders and ways of thinking that is all about being confident and knowing everything. And no wonder we live in a world where people take really strong positions or feel like they have to have an opinion on something. And so one of the things I feel that we need to learn as a society that is a skill that we've missed is this idea of confident humility. So the way that I've been thinking about it is that if trust is a confident relationship with the unknown, humility is a confident relationship with what we don't know. What's really interesting is when you look at people who are high in humility, um, they are really good at going on a journey and tolerating ambiguity and lots of complexity and realize that this is how learning happens. This is how we explore this space of not knowing. So they are very much on a journey. And when you look at people with an arrogant, closed-minded, fixed mindset, they very much are on a linear journey where there is a clear endpoint in their thinking, which is why their ideas and beliefs don't evolve. Now, to go on this journey of humility, what it involves is very deep trust in yourself. And what's really powerful is that people who feel confident enough to say, I don't understand something, or I might be wrong, or I don't quite know yet, are often people that we should trust because they're being really honest around the limitations of their knowledge and expertise. We've come out of 
decades of leadership that is really based on this idea that we should trust someone because they're super confident and super assertive. And one of the things that I hope we're going to see post-pandemic is actually respect for leaders that can admit that they don't know the answer or there's a limit to the information or they actually don't know what to do next. I feel like what we've learned through this pandemic is that when leaders pretend that they know, when there is no way of knowing, that really damages trust. Humility is also really powerful because when we learn this skill, we develop the ability that when new information comes into our life or our circumstances change, that really change the way we see something, we have the ability and the confidence to admit either we were wrong or that we now have a different belief and opinion on something. The thing that really excites me is that we have a generation growing up, I call them Generation Rethink, that are really challenging our beliefs and ideas on everything from gender and equality to sexuality. They are a rethinking generation and what they need are the skills and the knowledge to admit that they don't know things. And so the way I think about it is that we need to move from a world where we, our idea of trust is really based on assertiveness and arrogance and overconfidence to a world that is really valuing and teaching people how to be confident with humility. Because what we see is that humility leads us on a journey. It leads us on a journey of learning and discovery and curiosity, whereas arrogance is just an endpoint.